All right. Um, so let me, let me remind you where we left off. Where we left off was we were talking about the balance laws, linear and angular momentum balance. And we derived, starting from the integral uh, spatial forms, the local spatial forms. And the integral spatial forms are called Euler's laws of motion. And the local ones are attributed to Cauchy. Um, and the, for the linear momentum balance, the idea was, well, first there comes the statement of the um, linear momentum balance, which says that if you apply a net force to a body, which might be deformable, it might actually be rigid, it doesn't matter, then this causes a rate of change of the total momentum of the body. And we say, well, the total force is decomposed into uh, two parts. There can be surface forces, which we um, express as aerial density over the surface. So that is what we call the traction integrated over the boundary of the body, plus there could be a volumetric contribution, which we called the body force B. So that would be the density per unit mass uh, integrated over the volume. So that is equal to, that's equal to the total force. And that causes a total rate of change, rate of change of the total uh, linear momentum, which is rho V integrated over the volume of the body. OK. So, um, and that is a spatial expression, and that is an integral expression. So now, in order to uh, drive the local expression, the critical statement was the following, which we're going to discuss in more detail in this lecture. So first, we said that this, what is this thing called traction, uh, is intrinsically, just like every other variable here in uh, in Eulerian representation, it could, of course, be a function of position of time as well, but also of the um, normal that you are interested in at a uh, point. So um, if you like, I can go back and remind you or deliver you a number of quantities um, that similarly depend on a certain direction at a given point and time. Okay, so this is the fact that an object depends on position and time and a certain orientation represented by this unit normal is not a strange thing. I can remind you when we were talking about stretch, we had square of the stretch is equal to m dot cm. m is the right Cauchy green deformation trans tensor, f transpose f, and m is a unit vector that you choose on the reference configuration. So now you have a stretch, or if you like, let's put it this way, right? C is positive definite. This is for sure positive. Um, so lambda is a quantity that depends intrinsically on position and time through C, but also on a particular choice of a direction, right? So just so now this is scalar quantity, and now we have a, a vectorial quantity that similarly depends on position and time and a certain direction. Okay. Now, why we have that uh, dependence is, like I said, is something that we're going to discuss. But not only that, not only that, so there is an additional result which is due to Cauchy, and that is why the local forms are attributed to Cauchy, because this is a fundamental relation that allows us to make the transition to the local form. And Cauchy said, well, this particular expression, in fact, can be further, gen um, further specialized into the following form. And therefore, there exists some tensor, which is called the Cauchy stress tensor, operates on the unit normal uh, to the point that you're interested in and delivers you what the traction is. Okay, so if you like, this is some earlier in field as well. Okay. Now, we admitted the existence. So we said, well, okay, this we take for granted, and this result is something we're going to show eventually. Uh, but suppose we know this, and then we substituted this expression into the surface integral, we apply the surface divergence theorem, we obtain the local form. And the local form uh, transforms this, or the first term in the local form is associated with the uh, surface force, the second term directly with the volume force, and the last one is rho v dot, the acceleration. Okay? So that is the local form, local spatial form of linear momentum balance. And then, we went on to the angular momentum balance. And for angular momentum balance, 
we actually introduce, so if we have an observer, right, or some court reference, frame of reference, so let's draw it here, right? So this is our spatial point x. What we did was we introduced a reference point, x naught, okay? And with respect to that point, we indicated the relative coordinate to be relative position vector to be R naught. So R stands for the fact that it's a relative position and a naught to indicate that it's with respect to X naught, okay? And what's special about this point is that that point is stationary, okay? It doesn't move. It's any point, it doesn't have to be origin, but it is stationary. And then we said, well, there's a similar, um, similar result for the angular momentum balance, and it's stated independently, or postulated independently from the linear one, and it says that the moment about this point is equal to the rate of change of the total angular momentum of the body, again, with respect to that special point that we are talking about, right? Uh, now, I'm going to write that in more detail because we're going to work on it, uh, and I, therefore, you will rem you remind yourselves uh, the explicit expression. But now, uh, into that form, again, if you invoke the relation that Cauchy showed, the result is very simple. It simply says that the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric. So that is the that is the local spatial form of angular momentum balance. It's a very simple uh, res result, but of course it has uh, consequences. So this lecture, the first thing that we are going to do is again, admitting this form, okay, we are going to first show this, and thereby we're going to get rid of the proof associated with the angular momentum balance. Okay, so if traction is expressible in that form, then we will see that it induces the result which says the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric. Then we will step back and we will fill in the final missing piece in this discussion, which is to show the existence of a Cauchy stress tensor. Remember, the existence of attraction came very naturally. We said the total force has a volume and a surface contribution. This is the volume density, and this is the surface density of the force. So that discussion comes in naturally, but the fact that the traction is of that form requires some discussion. Okay, so let's get on with the proof of the symmetry of the um, stress tensor. So first, we start with the angular momentum balance, right? So we always remind ourselves the meaning, and then the expressions should come naturally. Well, there are three terms on the one side, I'll start with that term. There is the moment of momentum. So integral over R, moment with respect to which point? With respect to X naught, relative position is R naught. Moment of linear momentum. And that's the total rate of change. And that is due to the fact that I have um, forces which cause moments. And the only moments I have are due to these forces which I have. I don't have any density of moment independently. Right? We are talking about non-polar materials. So then over the volume, there is the moment of the body force, plus over the surface, there is the moment of traction. Okay. So again, if you, if you recall the meaning of the terms, then it's easy to express them. Now, I have here four, three terms. And you recognize that, again, the idea is, right? I want to drive the local form, which uh, which sort of requires that I express every term here as a volume integral. This is already a volume integral. I don't need to do anything. This is not, and this is, but the time derivative needs to move inside, so I need to be careful. So these are the terms uh, that I need to be careful about. Term number one and term number two. And let's proceed immediately with term number one. Okay. So time rate of change. <coughs> uh, 
of um, the total linear momentum, total angular momentum. So now I'm going to immediately apply the trick that we did several times here. I'm going to pull this integral back onto the reference configuration. And you can, we've done this already several times. Now we should be able to do that. You know, we don't need to show every step again and again. What we had done was whenever I see a rho d small v, I can convert that to rho naught, referential density, d capital V. And that is effectively the result for pulling that integral, this integral, back to the reference configuration. Okay. So now that the integral is over the reference configuration, I can move the time derivative inside. Right. So I have integral over R0, R0 dot cross rho naught v plus R0 cross rho v dot d capital V. Now, what we have to notice at this stage is that the time rate of change of R0 is not equal to 0, right? You can look at the picture over here, right? So this point will move with the body. This point and that point, they're fixed. So when this point moves, this position vector and that relative position vector will change. This vector is not changing, okay? Um, but so now we can go ahead and observe that R0 is equal to x minus x0. Okay? And when I take the time derivative of this, it's equal to the time rate of change of that, which is equal to v because x0 dot is equal to 0. That's a stationary point. Right? Do we all see that? Okay. So therefore, this thing is equal to zero, right? Because r naught dot is equal to the velocity, so you have a vector cross with itself, and it's equal to zero. So the result for the first term is equal to r naught. small r not, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot a not there at that stage, um, e dot db. Okay. Just to skip some lines as you express this final expression, what you can do is you can immediately push it back to the spatial configuration once again by eliminating this not in the density. So it's a spatial density, and this is the spatial infinitesimal volume, and now this is the spatial configuration. Okay. So this going back and forth uh, follows um, without much discussion. Okay, so that is the expression for the first term that we had. Um, now let's have a look at the second term. Now the second term, R not cross T dA. Integral over the boundary, R not cross the traction. Now I'm going to go ahead and invoke the conclusion of Cauchy, and I'm going to immediately write the traction as the Cauchy stress tensor times operating on the unit normal to the boundary point. Right? So I've taken that term. Instead of the traction, I've, I've, I've written Cauchy stress tensor operating on the unit normal. Um, and now this is a vector crossed with another vector, the traction vector. So that's a new vector. And I'm going to say that it has um, components with respect to a basis EI. Right. So now when I explicitly write that in terms of the components, um, then there should be a EI, the permutation symbol, and I'm going to go with EIJK. So this is the one that has to do bases, and then there's a J and a K. The J has to do with the first vector, so it's a R not J, and the second one has to do with the, the K, with the second vector. So the second vector is t, small tk, the traction, 
And in terms of the multiplication of these two objects, it's going to be, have the free index k, right? And then some dummy index l, all right? So this is traction k, traction k, r not j, e i j k e i. So that's the component form of this expression here. OK, so I'm going to uh, open that term now, right? So let's do it here. So we have integral over the boundary, but now there is a NL, right? And now I remember my stencil. If there is an object multiplying NL, I can convert that through to a volume integral where whatever multiplies nl appears inside brackets in this or parentheses. So in this case, e i j k r not j t k l. And instead of nl, I'm going to throw in comma l. And the basis e i remains. And now I have a volume integral. So I've applied the stencil for going from a surface integral to a um, volume integral. Right? So now that I have that volume integral, so that, that's the first, right? So I'm doing two things. One, instead of the traction, I'm putting the expression that involves the Cauchy stress tensor. And now that intrinsically will help me achieve a goal in converting that to a volume integral, right? So I've converted that to a volume integral because the normal now appears in that surface integral. So I convert it to a volume integral. And now I expand this. So, so, the, so I'm, I, what I'm trying to highlight is the fact that the traction is expressible in this form allows me to make, to make that transition, right? Without the normal, I cannot do it. Um, so I have E, I, J, K. So that's the derivative of the first term. E, I, J, K, it's a bunch of constants, ones and zeros and minus ones. So I took that out of the derivative anyway, comma L. Right? So that's equal to that. Right? And I'm going to work on this term down here. Let's do it like this. So this is partial with respect to XL. Um, X j minus x naught j. So that's the expression for r naught, x minus x naught. Okay. x naught, it's a constant. It doesn't depend on the absolute position of the points. So that derivative dies away. I only have partial xj over partial xl, and that is the chronicler delta, delta j. Let me write that really explicitly. That's equal to del xj del xl. And that's equal to delta jl. Good. So we're in pretty good shape. And therefore, this expression is equal to integral over the volume eijk, right? Um, e i j k t k l delta j l that makes it t k j, right? From the substitution property and the second term is have a look here. Now you recognize this object to be the divergence of this stress tensor, so that's a vector index k. J, K, and here I have E, I, J, K, basis E, I. So this expression is nothing but R naught cross divergence T. Okay, so I've recognized it as we've done before, as you've done in your homework and exam, actually. And I've written that final form in tensorial uh, setting. Okay, that's good.
So what I've done is I've now accomplished my goal of dealing with integrals one and two such that they are now pure volume integrals of something. Now I'm just going to collect everything together and see where that leads me. Okay, so have a look here for a second. Um, so there's term number one, right? Two and the third one. Um, I want to collect terms that naturally are asking to be collected. Okay, so now the first term is integral volume integral R not cross rho v dot. Okay, and then on the right hand side there is also R not cross rho b. And here there is a term R not cross divergence of t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that term and that term to the left hand side and put it together with that term. In other words, I'm going to obtain integral over the volume R not cross rho v dot minus rho b minus divergence of t dv. And the only thing that remains is the first term in the second expression, which, which is integral over the volume. So that remains on the right-hand side. E, I, J, K, T, K, J, D. Sorry, I forgot the basis. Um, I also forgot the basis over here. I'll just quickly add that in. So here we should have EI, right? Okay, so that term goes together with that term and this term, and on the right-hand side remains only this expression. Um, so you have a look at that result, and you recognize that the left-hand side is identically zero because that's what the local spatial form of linear momentum balance tells us, okay? Divergence of t plus rho b is equal to rho b dot, okay? So therefore, the right-hand side is equal to zero. And remember, this is true for arbitrary choices of our domain. And the only way this can be possible is if this expression here, the integrand, is actually equal to zero for every component okay, of the vector, for every component i. And that component is e i j k t k j, right? Has to be zero. Okay, and now we're almost done. Um, I will apply the E delta on I identity and the E delta identity allows us to reach the following conclusion. So zero is equal to, I'm go going to multiply this term with a set of numbers, the permutation symbol, E i m n. Every term that it multiplies is equal to zero, so after multiplication addition over the index i, the result is still equal to zero. Okay? E i j k t k j. Okay? All right? Each one of these is equal to zero. There's a sum over i, the result is still equal to zero for every choice of m and n. Okay? Um, so now this the multiplication of two permutation simples with a shared summation index is what we call the E delta identity. We can re-express it as delta mj delta mk minus delta mk delta nj. And tkj remains as it is. And therefore, we have the final result. I use the substitution property, right? M goes, cancels J, N cancels K. So it's T and M minus, that's an M, that's an N. Okay? Or,
the stress is symmetric. Okay, so to summarize, as soon as you have the result that Cauchy concluded, namely that the traction is a stress tensor multiplying a unit normal, then that is instrumental, that result is instrumental in driving the local form of the angular momentum balance. And the result is what I expressed before, the symmetry of the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay? So the only thing that remains presently is to actually derive Cauchy's expression, namely that the traction is a stress tensor multiplying the normal. Okay? And that's what we're going to concentrate on in the remaining minutes of this lecture. Okay? So there are a couple of questions, I think. So let's begin here. You were going to say I forgot the basis when I first wrote it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Because right. Uh, well, because this choice of the object is arbitrary. Okay. So it has to be true for arbitrarily small pieces of the domain. Okay. And then there is something called in, um, in, in, in uh, mathematics that is typically applied in continuum mechanics and also numerical methods like finite elements, um, so which is called the localization theorem, which says that if you have such an arbitrary domain and the integral is equal to zero and under suitable conditions like the continuity of the variables you're looking at, and we are implicitly assuming smooth stress fields here, okay, that goes without saying, um, then the integr integral is equal to zero if and only if the integrand is equal to zero. Okay. So that's actually, that's a good question. It is not. The fact that this equals zero means this equals zero is not a given. It holds under certain cases, but in our case it does hold. Okay. Everybody's done writing that board. I'm going to pull up this one. And just remind you where we are. That was the summary. Now we're done with that part. We'd already completed this part. And actually, this result we used in concluding this together with this expression here. So now I'm going to first argue this form and tell you that it makes sense to introduce the dependence of the traction on a, on a unit normal or some given direction. And then we're going to drive that. Okay? So let's proceed with that. So the stress tensor. OK, so now the argument is uh, it's quite robust, actually. But some parts of it are critical. Some parts of it are actually not that trivial. Uh, perhaps we're going to skip a little bit to those discussions. Uh, and what I want to eventually concentrate on is the proof that the traction is expressible as a tensor multiplying a normal. But before we come to that point, we have to make a few arguments. And the arguments are as follows. Now, first of all, every quantity that I'm so far looking at, so all quantities depend on position and time. Okay, so we're in an Eulerian setting presently. And so presently, for instance, uh, for instance, if I'm looking at the body force has the following Eulerian representation. But the traction depends on more. And there is a very simple way to see that. Uh, what I can do is I can take a um, quite straightforward example. I'll take a bar. And I'm going to pull on that bar with a force P. And at a given position x at, along the bar, right? I'm going to divide it into two parts, part one and part two. And I'm going to uh, look at uh, what happens um, to the two pieces. right? So on the left-hand side, I see 
So that would be the free body diagram of the left side. This would be the free body diagram of the right side. One and two. Um, here on the left hand side I have a traction field. Okay. It's most likely not uniform. I'm drawing it as though it is uniform as we did in our undergraduate mechanics course often. So I feel like this is like an averaged value. It doesn't matter. Um, so then on the left hand side I have a traction field. Now notice that I'm looking at a certain position at time t, okay? At a given time, because the force itself could depend on time, right? Uh, at a given time, at a given position, I'm looking at that, this point, and I'm looking at the traction distribution. Why is there a traction distribution? Because there is a net force, and to balance that, I have to have some traction distribution, right? And I'm looking at the same point at the same time, but I have, obviously, two different traction fields. One is pointing to the right, one is pointing to the left. So to distinguish them, let me call the one on the left T1. That's at position and time xt, and the one on the right is T2. At position and time, at the same position and time. And now I ask myself, well, uh, I'm looking at the same position at the same time, but the directions are not the same, right? So obviously the traction is a Eulerian field that certainly does depend on position and time, but that cannot be the whole story. It must depend on something else. And the thing that distinguishes the left side of this picture from the right side is only one thing, which is the outward unit normal to the surface. This has a unit normal N1, and this has a unit normal N2. And they are clearly related by the expression which says they are of they are along the same direction but or along the same uh, line but um, in different directions so the traction must be equal must also be a function of the normal okay now not only that now I also recognize that the tractions on the left and right sides so that is the first conclusion, if you like. The second conclusion is a little bit uh, more drastic, and it's going to also have consequences. Um, I also noticed that the traction on the left-hand side is of equal magnitude to the one on the right, but in opposite direction. That's like action and reaction, what we have accustomed ourselves to from Newton's like laws and etc. cetera, right? Um, this actually, if you're not comfortable with it, it's a result that one could eventually find out through the process that we're about to follow, which is called the Cauchy process, which leads to the expression that this is equal to the stress times tensor times normal. Okay? So that result says that T1, which is equal to the traction evaluated at a given position and time, along a different along a given normal. Let's call this simply n, and so this is minus n. So along a given normal n is in equal magnitude but opposite direction, right? So why don't you have a look here for a second, right? So let me put this in words. T1, at a given position, traction at a given position and time, along a given direction n, which, is, I, picked the, which I picked to be that direction, n1, is in equal magnitude but opposite direction to T2. And T2 is the traction evaluated at the same position and time but along normal N2, which is minus N. Which simply sort of indicates that this expression is probably linear in N, right? Because there is a minus there and a minus there, and those minuses come out, cancel each other, and leads to a positive expression, okay? Again, this is actually something that could come out of the Cauchy process, but let's take this for uh, granted if you're not super comfortable with it. Okay. Um, all right, so now I made two observations. I could draw a general picture, and the same observations, of course, still hold. And that general picture is, suppose I have some object, and 
I apply some forces to that object. So F1, F2, F4, F5. And now I take a free body diagram of the two pieces that lie to the left and right of an arbitrary cut. So this is the left portion. That's the right portion. and F4. That's body one, or portion one of the body, portion two of the body. So there will be a traction distribution at this interface. I don't know how it will look, right? I'm just making up. But whatever it is, I know that The traction field on the left-hand side, T1, is going to be of equal magnitude but opposite traction to the traction field on the right-hand side, which I called T2. The statically equivalent expression right, for these tractions will amount to a net force and a moment at the interface. right? And those forces and moments are also equal and opposite, right? Equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So likewise, the traction is also equal and opposite in uh, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So that result is not is not something very new, right? So the second result is something that we expect. Um, so um, therefore, so let me um, state our major result. The second one, actually. Once more, the traction depends on the normal, but it depends in a very special way that implies action reaction principle. Now, this result, by the way, is called Cauchy's lemma. And as soon as you have Cauchy's lemma at hand, okay, right? As soon as you have this result together with the expression or the knowledge that traction depends on the normal as well, the so-called Cauchy process is a process of proof, let me say, of geometric means leads to this result, which is Cauchy's Theorem. Okay. And this is now what we're going to prove. Okay. okay. So in this one board, I summarize a discussion that actually is more detailed and deserves more attention than I've displayed here. Right? It's, it's, uh, so, so this argument, as well as that argument, is something we could talk about a little bit longer. Um, but, but I've just sort of argued that this has to be the case. And I think you've sort of accepted it through this argument that there needs to be a dependence on the normal. And well, action reaction is something we already know. Then this equality has to hold. And believing those, now we're going to apply Cauchy's theorem and show that. And that's what I'd like to concentrate on in detail. Um, now, uh, what you have to be, again, careful is the following. When you talk about the stress tensor, the Cauchy stress tensor, it's an Eulerian field that depends only on position and time. Okay? So it's defined at a given position at a given time. So at a given position, irrespective of the normal, there is a single stress tensor. Right? 
But the traction at a given position and time depends on the particular direction that you are looking at. So in other words, if you are looking at that point, and if you're interested in the stress field at that point, there is only one stress, stress tensor. But if you're interested in the traction, the value of the traction that you will observe, magnitude and direction, will depend on how you take the scot. If you take it like this, it's going to be one value. If you take it like that, it's going to be another one. If you take it like that, there's going to be another one because every one of these surfaces has a different normal. Okay? And it also depends on which side of the cut you're looking at. And in that case, the traction is going to change sign. Okay? All right. Questions on that board? All right. So now, let's prove Cauchy's theorem. Okay? And that's a very elegant proof. As I said, we follow some, we will follow a geometric argument. It's fairly clean. And it's the last important piece in our puzzle of driving local forms of the linear and angular momentum balance laws. So the proof for the existence of the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay. And the process that we're going to follow is called Cauchy's process or the Cauchy process. So we are interested in the stress tensor at some, or the traction distribution, if you like, in a region associated with a region in a domain. Right? This is our domain R. I want to know what happens at a given position x at a given time. Now, at a given time is important, of course, but time plays no role in the derivation. Just to make things compact, I'm going to skip it. But that, it's at, on the background, right? So everything depends on time as well. Okay, so I'm not going to show time explicitly. So I'm interested in what happens at a given, um, at a given um, position x. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Choose a tetrahedron here that nicely, the vertex of which nicely sits at this position x. Okay? Just a tetrahedron. Okay? And in fact, it's going to be eventually a special tetrahedron. If the basis vectors are e1, e2, and e3, I'm going to choose the, uh, the, the three directions that define the planes of the tetrahedron to be E1, E2, and E3 as well. Right? Um, the size of the tetrahedron is not necessarily very small at this stage. Of course, it makes sense that it's sufficiently small or relatively small with respect to this body we're analyzing, but it's actually arbitrarily large. Okay? Um, so, and that tiny domain I'm going to call the Cauchy tetrahedron. And let's call it a domain C, right? All domains we indicate with some calligraphic letter, in this case, calligraphic C. And I'm going to draw it once again over here. So as I said, the axes that define the normals, I will pick them to be aligned with the three basis vectors. They don't have to be, right? These, these are inconsequential choices, but certainly choices that somewhat simplify our derivation. Okay? Um, and my tetra, the tetrahedron is as follows. OK. That's the surface of the tetrahedron. Right? Um, the tetrahedron has three surfaces, flat surfaces. Um, here, the bottom surface has a outward unit normal, which is minus E3. 
and it has a certain area. Let's call that A3. Okay? The left surface has an outward unit normal minus E2, and it has an area, let's call that A2, and this one has an outward unit normal right? in that direction. Draw it here. Minus E1, and it has an area A1. Now, the areas are arbitrary and they are determined by the normal to this tetrahedron surface, this inclined surface. This inclination, it's up to me. Okay? Uh, but in any case, that is a flat surface and therefore the surface is defined by its orientation. So there is a unit normal here. Okay? Okay. So, so that unit normal is defined if you like. I'll take a projection from the vertex, a perpendicular projection to right? perpendicular projection from the surface from the vertex to the surface, and that perpendicular direction projection is in the direction of the outward unit normal, which I will call n. And n is my pick. So looking from the side, the picture that I would see is, right, looking along, uh, let's say, or in 2D, okay. That's the vertex, that's the perpendicular projection, and that's the outward unit normal to that surface. Um, and the distance from the vertex to that inclined surface is what I will call h. Okay. And the area of the surface, inclined surface, let's call it simply a. Okay. Now, um, first of all, we have the volume, expression for the volume of that tetrahedron, which is simply 1 over 3 area times the height associated with that projection. Right? Uh, now I will also define the area vector, A, which is the total area times the outward unit normal, N. And I can also express that in terms of components, N, I, E, I. Now, ni, you will remember, that's a direction. And a direction can also be interpreted as a vector whose components are the direction cosines, right? So this is associated with the cosine of the angle between this and, for instance, if i is equal to 1 and e1, etc. So therefore, a times ni is nothing but the projection of this a the area along direction i, which precisely happens to be what I called either E3, 2, or 1. So in other words, this is ai. Okay. So those are some basic geometric results that we observe. Okay. And those, that result is perhaps more apparent here if this is a, this is A1, which is A times the cosine of uh, that angle, and A times cosine of this angle is eventually going to be A2. Okay. Yes? I'm sorry, this is just to correct that 1D picture. This would be A1. This would be A2. Huh? A is. A is the area of the inclined surface of the tetrahedron. Okay. Good. Do you, do you have questions about that picture? Further questions? Because if that picture is absolutely clear to you, now we'll proceed with some uh, calculations. Any questions?
Um, notice that I want to distinguish between the multiple position vectors that will appear shortly. For me, x indicates, before making a transition to this point, the location of the vertex. So x is the position vector of the vertex only, and that's fixed. Now, the size of the state trade ring can be arbitrary, and as the size changes, the size of the domain C is changing, the area is changing, etc. I can choose the outward unit normal n arbitrarily that will simply change this inclination or the shape of the state tetrahedron a little bit. But notice that I can also move within the domain of the tetrahedron, and I need a separate position coordinate for that. Okay? So I've already called this x. Okay? And to indicate the position within the tetrahedron, now I need to pick some additional um, coordinate. And I'm going to call that, okay, y. Okay? So y will indicate the position vector that, that is attributed with the points that lie within the Cauchy tetrahedron. x is the position of the vertex. So with that notation, now let me proceed with the expression for linear momentum balance. So I'm going to write the linear momentum balance for the Cauchy tetrahedron. We can do so because we, the uh, balance holds for arbitrary choices of the domain. And in this case, the domain is the tetrahedron. So rate of change of the total linear momentum, right? And I've moved already the time derivative insight. That's the conclusion that we had reached before. Um, and there is the body force. And now there are the tractions that lie on the surfaces of the tetrahedron. Okay? And it has four surfaces. Right? Now, notice at this stage, I don't know that the traction is a stress tensor times a normal. That's precisely what I'm trying to show with this process. So it's just the surface density of the force traction. That's what I have. All right. So. Um, I'm th these are both volume integrals. I'm going to put that term to the left-hand side. So it's an integral over the volume of the tetrahedron, V dot minus B, dV. And now I will split the surface integral into four terms. Okay? There is the inclined surface, and there are the three surfaces with out nor unit normals, minus E1, 2, or 3. Okay? So first, the one with... the inclined surface, so I'm putting a superscript to indicate which surface I'm referring to. That's the inclined one. And there I have a traction field evaluated at a point on that inclined surface. There, can, there are multiple points, of course, on that surface, so I'm putting the position vector within the tetrahedron, so that's y. But the normal of every point is shared, and that's n. Okay. That's dA. Plus, sum over the three surfaces, integral over every surface, which is uh, perpendicular to the basis vectors, t tilde, position on that surface, and the outward unit normal. And the outward unit normal in every case is minus ei. So now I invoke a conclusion that I reached before. If I have a traction evaluated at a point along a normal, and in this case it also already happens to have the minus sign, this minus sign actually comes out as it is. So in other words, this thing is, is equal in magnitude but in opposite direction to the traction at the same point, but with a normal that's opposite to this one, which is plus EI. Okay? So that's an important step. So therefore, on the right-hand side, I have integral over del C n, t tilde y n, dA, minus sum over i, integral over the del C i, t tilde y e i.
Now remember, again, I'm not showing the dependence on time. It goes without saying that that dependence is there. So on the left-hand side, I have a volume integral. or Everything on the right-hand side is a surface integral. This volume integral, the terms that appear in it are Eulerian fields that depend on position and time. Time is not represented explicitly. And I will just, because eventually it turns out these terms are not important per se, as they are, I'm just going to call, give them a generic representation. I'm going to call it f tilde. And they depend on position. And therefore, when I make a transition to this final expression that I'm going to work on, I'm just going to put here some function. I don't really care what it is. What is important is that that function appears inside the volume integral. Eventually, that's all that's going to matter. And this is a result which I will call star. Okay. Now, um, in your fundamental math courses that you've taken several years ago, probably, you, from those courses, you might recall a result which says the following. If I have a function, okay, um, in this case, it's 1D, right? This is x, and this is some function. Let me call that function g of x, or let's call it y. Why not? Function of y. Um, and I'd like to find out the integral of this function over this region. In other words, the area under the curve, right? Um, a result tells us that I can find that. So let's say the length is l, OK? The result tells us that there exists a particular point, let's call it y bar, such that the area under the curve is equal to the function evaluated at that special point times the length or the size of the domain. What's that theorem called? So g is equal to integral divided by L. Okay. So G is the mean, right? So it's the mean value here. OK, so now, of course, that transition is also not straightforward and applies in some, uh, um, some careful set of assumptions, among which we invoke the fact that this function is sufficiently well behaved, like continuous, et cetera. OK? And that's what we're going to assume, right? If there are jumps, et cetera, some, uh, let's say, pathological behavior of the function, then there might not be such a transition. But if this is a nice, smooth function that is continuous, actually, let's say smoothness is not important, then that result applies. So now I have integrals that are over domains which I will, to which I will apply the mean value theorem. And I will look at those terms one by one. So first of all, let us state the mean value theorem for a volume and a surface so that the notation applies to our terms in a nice manner. So assuming um, sufficient smoothness, um, use the mean value theorem. And the mean value theorem says that there exists, for instance, a um, right. There exists a special point y bar within the domain D, such that if you would like to integrate a function over the domain, what you can do is you can evaluate that function at a special point at that special point y bar, and multiply it with the size of the domain. Okay. If that's a volume integral, then that is a, the, the volume of the domain. Right? So likewise, if you are on a surface, if you're on the boundary of the domain, and you're trying to integrate something on that boundary or a given surface, then there exists a special point, again, y bar, such that the area times the function evaluated at that point is equal to that surface integral. Now, that's a big parenthesis. Now we can go back to the term that I called star, which is the linear momentum balance posed on the Cauchy tetrahedron. That equality, that balance, 
is equivalent to. Now, on the left-hand side, I have the integral of the function, which I call just f. It's well, acceleration minus the body force times the density, right? Uh, integrated over the volume. Now, I know that there exists a point. Let's call that simply again y bar. Uh, at which that function is evaluated. And I multiply it with the volume of the tetrahedron, and that's equal to the left-hand side of that expression. Okay? And on the right-hand side, I have two terms. One of them is the integral over the inclined surface of the traction. The traction is a field, y, and every point on that surface has a normal n. And now there exists a special point, y bar, such that I evaluate the traction at that point, multiply it with the area of the inclined surface, which is A, and that's equal to that integral. And then I have the second term on the right-hand side, sum over the surfaces that are normal, uh, with normals aligned with the um, uh, basis vectors. Uh, the traction on every surface, again, depends on position and the normal. So in this case, we took the minus sign outside, EI. Um, the normal is a constant, so now there exists a special point y bar, but that point is different for every surface, and I want to distinguish that. Eventually, it really doesn't matter, but for every surface, there is another special point, so I'll just put a superscript i here. Okay? And in fact, I'm sorry, let's go back here and put a superscript n here, because that is also another special point. It's not the same as that one. Okay? Um, and multiplied by the size of the domain, which is ai. Okay. So every integral on the left hand and right hand side, we apply to every integral, we apply the mean value theorem, and all of a sudden pops out these special points, y bar, y bar n, and three points here. So five special points. Okay. What are they? I don't know what they are. Do we care? Not really. Okay. Not really. All we care about is that they exist. OK, so now, what is the volume? The volume is 1 over 3, the area of the inclined surface, times the height associated with the tetrahedron. Right? And ai is nothing but the area multiplying ni, the components of the normal. Okay? Um, so therefore, this result is equivalent to what I'm going to do is I want to take these terms to the left-hand side. So T tilde y bar n n minus, okay, so I'm dealing with these terms, sum over i, T tilde y bar i, e i, n i, right? So I keep the ni in here. Now this area, that one, that one, and that one, they die. Right? So these are terms already here. And on the right-hand side, I have f tilde 1 over 3 times h. All right, so now this is the result that I wanted. Now, I'm interested in what happens at a point, and so far I'm dealing with a arbitrarily sized tetrahedron. So the process, as one typically follows, is to deduce something about what happens at a point, your domain that you're trying to analyze should shrink to an infinitesimal size. In this case, that's my tetrahedron. It should shrink to this point. And as I do so, I should be careful to preserve this normal, in other words, when it shrinks, it has to shrink. Right? This normal, preserving its normal, has to move in that direction. Right? So all these points, they shrink in such a way that the normal is preserved. And the tetrahedron shrinks to a point. To which point? To point x. Okay? So as that happens, every point y within the tetrahedron also approaches x. Okay? And any special point that lies within or on the tetrahedron also shrinks to x. Okay? So, and h shrinks to 0, right? and so the volume shrinks to 0. Right? So let's take those into account. So we're going to say let 
C shrink towards the point x, right? And so h is going to go to 0. And every point, every special point, or arbitrary point, in fact, that lies on the surface, in this case, y bar i's and y bar n's, that's what I care about, they shrink to that special point x. There is no more any, uh, any difference between whether you refer to y bar or x, because they are arbitrarily close to each other. And therefore, I look at the expression that I had, and as that shrinkage occurs on the right hand side in that expression, h is going to 0. And that's why I told you that this volume function f is really, I don't care about what it exactly is, because it multiplies something that goes to 0, it dies away anyway. Okay? So that is to say that the surface terms will dominate, and the body country, volume contributions will eventually be negligible when the size of the object is very small. But what is on the left-hand side still remains as it is. The only difference being that instead of y bars, I'm going to throw in x's. Okay? So the equality becomes t tilde of x n. And instead of subtracting, I'm going to put that term, the second term, to the right-hand side. And I'm going to write sum over i t tilde x outward normal e i n i. Uh, now, this is a very particular traction. It's the traction at a position and time that is aligned with, 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 that is on a surface whose outward unit normal is EI. So because it's so special, I want to give it a special notation. I'm going to put a superscript I. So that's the traction at a given position, X and time. And i indicates that it's on the normal with outward normal, on the surface with outward normal ei. Okay. So this expression, therefore, is equal to um, and I'm going to invoke the summation convention here, um, although it's a little bit non-conventional because there are two i's there that this is not exactly a component, but I use it anyway. Um, and that's ni, and I know that ni is ei dot n. Okay. Questions so far? Right? I've, I haven't done anything special, right? After I shrunk the uh, tetrahedron, uh, the volume function disappeared, and instead of y bars, I threw in x's, right? And that's the equality that I have, okay? And instead of ni, I have thrown ei dot n. Remember, what was my goal in doing all of this? To show that traction, which depends on position and time, and a given outward unit normal, is expressible in terms of a tensorial function that depends on position and all alone, times the normal. So you take the normal outside of that expression in a very special manner. And I've accomplished my goal, you see, because this is ei dot n, and now I can write this as t tilde i bun ei operating on n. Okay, that's it. Okay. And therefore, this must be the stress tensor that I was looking for which is called the Cauchy stress tensor. Right. Again, it depends on time as well. So in general, we have, therefore, traction depending on position, time, and an outward unit normal is expressible in terms of a tensorial function of position and time multiplying the normal explicitly. Okay, And done. OK, that's a pretty neat result, right? And the proof is, I think, rather elegant as well. And the summary of the proof is that we took a <coughs> arbitrarily sized object, a free body diagram, let's say, from the body that we're trying to analyze. And that is the Cauchy tetrahedron. We wrote down the linear momentum balance on it and shrunk it to zero size. 
And that delivers us the expression that we were seeking. And now at this stage, we're done. Okay? So what we've done is we've shown all the steps that lead to the local forms of the linear and angular momentum balance laws. Okay? And we also had derived the local form of the mass balance as well. But remember, everything so far is in spatial form, in spatial integral or local forms. Now, you might ask, well, for the mass balance, we also had a referential form. In particular, we defined something called the referential density, et cetera. So is it possible to write down these laws um, either in integral or local form on the reference configuration? Okay? And the answer, it turns out, is yes. And just like we had to introduce a referential density to do that, in this case as well, we have to introduce referential quantities that are associated with in particular, the stress tensor. And if we do so, we can write these laws also in referential form. And we don't do it just for the fun of it. We do it because those forms are also needed. All right. Um, now, putting that to the back of our minds, that's going to be the subject of the next lecture. And that will be the last lecture on the first part of the course and the last lecture on balanced laws as well. Um, let me just um, talk a little bit more about this result and the stress tensor, and try to make a link to what you know from undergraduate mechanics. So let's do that. I think it's useful. So let's recall undergraduate mechanics. So on undergraduate mechanics, uh, when we were talking about the stress, we had a geometric way of representing the stress. And to do that, we took a cube. And that cube, of course, was in, of infinitesimal size. And we have our coordinate axes uh, x, y, z, let's say, in terms of a typical undergraduate notation. Right? And then uh, we indicated the stress components, again, typically as follows. Well, there are the normal stresses on every surface. And we indicate them only with a sigma, right? normal stress on the three surfaces. But now we said, well, these are three stresses that lie at a given point, three stress components, but there is for sure something different about them. And the difference comes from the normal that you're looking at. Okay, that was the argument. But that is not the only type of stress you can have. These are normal. You can have also shear stresses. So on a given normal, in a given direction, right? So that would be one positive direction. This would be another positive direction. This would be one positive direction. Again, this would be another one yet another one, and yet another one. And the typical argument was in terms of remembering what these indices are. So first of all, they are shear stresses. So we said on the plane with normal y in the direction, let's say, z. Okay? And um, on the plane with normal z in the direction y. And I know, of course, that they are equal to one another. right? So this would be on the plane with normal uh, x in the direction z, and that is equal to tau zx, right? And finally, this is on the plane with normal x in the direction y, and that's equal to tau yx. Okay? And then, that is the geometric way of representing the stress at a point, and the uh, matrix representation is simply, you put them into a three by three matrix. And x, y, z is like one, two, three. So you have the diagonal components. And then one, two would be x, y, et cetera. OK. So now. Um, to make a relation to these tractions that we defined over there, in particular traction superscript 1, 2, and 3, we can simply do the following. Well, we had t1, 2, 3. What do they mean? They mean the force per unit area right, at a given point. So this is a finite area, but remember, it's very small. So it really represents a point on the plane with normal ei. Okay? And that EI is either, so this is E2, this is E1, this is E3. So the traction at that point, at that point, on the plane with normal 1 would be T1, 
one on the plane with normal two, T two on the plane with normal three, that would be T three. Okay. So this is a geometric interpretation, if you like, of what we employed in the expression for the stress tensor. The stress tensor was, right, let me write it here, Ti1 Ei. And so that's attraction at a point on the plane with normal Ei, right? Now, if you compare these two pictures, the components of these tractions are nothing but, so this, this traction has a normal and tangential components. And those components are precisely the stress components. So um, T1 must be equal to sigma x tau yx tau zx. Here I'm using the fact that tau yx is equal to tau xy. Okay. T2 is equal to tau xy sigma y tau zy, etc. And then you can write the third one. And in fact, this one here is T1, and that one is T2, and that one is T3, right? If you compare, that's exactly what they are. Okay. So in other words, this thing is equal to T1, T2, and T3. Um, so, combining the results that, that, that we've reached geometrically, right, the stress tensor that we knew from right, undergraduate mechanics is also something that is, in term, this is expressible in terms of the tractions associated with these special planes. Right? So therefore, this expression is actually exactly equal to this expression. So the stress that we were talking about is actually the Cauchy stress tensor. Now I say that with some caution, and let me put an exclamation mark. In typical undergraduate mechanics, we assume we make some assumptions like small deformations, right? Here I made no such assumption whatsoever, right? And um, under those assumptions, um, we prefer, and actually I prefer to use that special notation which says that the Cauchy stress tensor is um, symbolically expressed as sigma. This is the Cauchy stress tensor, but it turns out that in general there are many stress tensor if, tensors if the deformations are large. If the deformations are small, there is only one stress tensor, and that's why typically one chooses to express it with a special notation. All right. But if you forget about that for a second, the stress tensor we had in undergraduate mechanics is exactly the Cauchy stress tensor. All right. Now, let me convince you about that a little bit more. In other words, namely, that these components are associated uh, form-wise with exactly the Cauchy stress tensor that we derived. And to do that, right, I'll write a few more. So first of all, right, let's make the point again that Ti is the traction. on plane with normal EI, right? And that is already the definition of TI, but let's make that explicit. If the traction operates on N, that's the, sorry, the stress tensor operates on N, that's the definition for traction. But now I'm going to pick a special normal, which is EI, and I'm going to throw in the expression for T. T is equal to sum TJ, bond EJ, and now that operates on EI, and that result is equal to TJ EI dot EJ. This is delta IJ, that's the Kronecker delta. 
and that's equal to T i. So that just verifies our uh, interpretation. Now the second thing is if you like to calculate the components T i j of the stress tensor, then what you have to do is you have to operate on ej first and then dotted with ei. That will extract the component i of that vector. Now that vector, I already know what it is. It is tj. Okay. So that's equal to ei dot tj. And that is therefore the component i of the traction vector that is associated with the plane with normal ej. That's Tij. Um, so that is the surface normal. And that is the component. And that is also sigma ij. So if you interpret i, j to be, let's say, x, y, y, z, etc., right? Then you get the expression for the stress in the notation of undergraduate mechanics, and those components are associated with the components of the traction vectors that allowed us to write the form of the Cauchy stress tensor. They're related to those components through this direct expression, okay? So the component i of the traction on the plane with normal ej is sigma ij, okay? So if this is, let's say, 2, 3, you're on the plane with normal e3, you're looking at component 2, so that, that would be sigma 2, 3. So that's like tau yz, right? Let's write an example. If this is 2, if this is 3, then this would be 2, 3, this would be 3, 2, so that's like tau xy, and that's like tau, sorry, it's like tau yz, and this is like tau cy.